Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to talk about earth changes and prophecy. My guest is my old friend, Daryl Robert Schoon, who is a spiritualist minister with the Church of Universality in Tucson, Arizona. Daryl is also the author of many books, including You Can't Always Get What You Want, Light in a Dark Place, The Time of the Vulture, Report to the Select Committee of Intelligence of the House of Representatives. Is God Confused? And The Way to Heaven. Welcome, Daryl. Congratulations again on the ability <laughs> to <laughs> send out those titles. Remember your many titles. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, have, I have to go <laughs> like that myself. I go, uh -huh. boy, Jeffrey, that's good. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's one way to introduce me. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are many ways to yeah. introduce you. There's I'll many say ways that. to introduce anything, uh -huh. any subject, any because it's all you know. Everything's a relationship, uh -huh. and and so. Any relationship depends on how it's viewed. Yeah. So, in fact, when we discussed these things, I thought, how am I going to look at it? And that's why when um, I found so fascinating the thing that brought us together, because I had sent you the book, the, the pre-publication manuscript of a uh, uh, letter to House Select Committee on Intelligence. Yes. And which talked about a you know, a nefarious embezzlement of $500 million leading to events around 9-11. And your response was quite amazing. Your response was, Daryl, this is fascinating. He said, perhaps this could be a subject of a, of a topic on uh, the nature of conspiracy theories. That is a far, that's a highly evolved relationship to what I had written. He's trying to get to uh, a kind of overview. A view, another yeah, level. Right, a metaphysical level, view. Which is what I want to do now on this okay. topic of earth changes. Now. This is a topic that I have a strong connection with. Why? Because I associate it with my introduction to metaphysics, all right, which happened in the Haight-Ashbury. All right, I'm in law school in 1966, Hastings College of the Law. I'm a political radical at the time. And uh, that fall, I took acid. Okay? But the, the thing that really kicked open the door of my mind, <laughs> I mean, Acid just sort of took the doors off, all right? But the thing in my mind that kicked open the doors was when Bob the Candlemaker did my astrology chart, all right? Bob the Candlemaker, he was, I find out later, he had been a TA at Berkeley, all right? Many years as a graduate student in, in Spanish. Yeah, a TA is teaching, teaching assistant, assistant for those who may not know. Yes. And, and and so I meet him in the Haight Ashbury. He's he's just one of those people in the Haight Ashbury, yep. and he he's known as Bob the Candlemaker to us. We call him Bob the Candlemaker because he made these candles, mm. and they were incredibly Moorish. They're complicated, beautiful candles. And so we talked to him, and Bob said he wanted to do my chart. Bob was really into astrology. Mm. I didn't believe astrology. All right, like most a lot of people don't believe in astrology, and I and most people don't believe astrology. Know nothing about it. All right. And I didn't either. Mm -hmm. But I was going to humor him because we wanted his candles in our store. So Bob said, I need your birth date and where you were born. Mm -hmm. So I went and got my birth certificate. You had a store at the time. <laughs> yeah, psychedelic shop on Haight Street. Uh -huh. And we were trying to get Bob to put his candles on consignment in our store. Yeah. This store was so crazy, Jeff, that one day a guy comes by and we're all naked in the store, uh -huh. 1967. On Haight Street, yeah. right across from the Street Theater. And the guy was selling uh, uh, pipes, hash pipes. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I said, he said, can I show them to you? And we said, well, if you take off your clothes. And he took off his clothes, too. <laughs> and he showed us the hash pipes. <laughs> All right. This was 1967, Haight Street between Cole and Stanyan. Uh -huh. We're in the middle of it. Yeah. Okay. So um, he does my chart, and he does my wife's chart this time. And I didn't believe it. I mean, I had no... 
experience with astrology. I just thought it was one of those things in the Sunday section and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Well, he hit a bullseye in my relationship with my father. He hit a bullseye in my in my uh, wife's relationship with what had happened. Her mother died. It was st- it was like he called it to a T. Mm-hmm. And now, Jeffrey, my mind couldn't believe it. How could how could this know this? Right. How could this thing predict that I would have a certain kind of relationship with my father? I had been at war with my father since I was five years old, and it was going to last for thirty more years. And knowing this took the took a lot of the personal sting out of it because it made it impersonal. That whoever was going to be my father, we were going to have this relationship with. That's what the astrology chart said. All right? So it took a lot of the, it's him and me. Yeah. It's the dynamic of my, of who was going to be my father, my relationship in my lifetime. Yeah. So I leave Bob the Cannabaker's house and I'm stunned. I'm stunned at the implications of the accuracy of these readings. I'm so stunned because now I think, is this true? I mean, how can it be true, Jeffrey, that, that giving the person when you were born and where you were born, they could extrapolate a plant of, o- over your life? I mean, that's... That, that's right. It defies conventional logic. It defies conventional logic. I love it. You didn't say it defies logic. It defies conventional logic. Well, all logic is based on premises. Absolutely. Very. See, now that's why you... <laughs> you're, this is wonderful, all right? Because your, your use of words is clarifying. It def- and it does defy conventional logic. And I was a victim of conventional logic at the time. My logic has become very unconventional <laughs> since that period. All right. But at the time, I was still conventionally logical. Yep. And I was stunned. So by the time I got home, which was only a few blocks away, I, th- I was thinking about it. I thought, if this is true, if astrology is true, what it means is there's a connection between each and every one of us and the universe. Because if I have a chart which is written in the stars and somebody can go to a book and read what those angles of the stars mean and tell me what my life is pretty true, far more than I thought it was going to, that meant I was connected with the universe, with the stars, irrespective of how it got connected, irrespective of how ephemeris were, irrespective of how the interpretations came out, there was a causal collection. Yeah. And it was true whether I knew about it or not. Because the day before, I didn't believe this at all. Now I thought... It could be true. So that meant we were, if this were true, each and every one of us was connected to it, to the universe, to the physical universe. The second thing was, where was the free will? That what burned a hole. And I've been tossing that around for decades, and I, I've resolved it, basically, in a very practical sense of my own life. But those were the two things that came up first. Now, there I am in the hate ashbury my mind's getting blown Physiological, physically, with all the acid I'm taking, with all the new stuff I'm reading. I mean, and one of the things that, that was going around at the times was Edgar Casey. Mm-hmm. Another thing that defied logic. All right, the story of Edgar Casey. Yes, he lost his voice. He was hoarse. They hypnotized him to bring him back. He lived in Kentucky, twelve years old. His voice, this voice came out of him. All right, yeah. a voice. Came out of it. While he's under hypnosis. While he's under hypnosis. Because hypnosis was sort of new at the time. Yep. And his voice differed in timber, tone, and quality than Edgar Casey's voice. All right? And the voice started talking about things that Edgar Casey didn't know. Egypt. He's a kid in Kentucky. I mean, at one point, Edgar Casey was a Sunday school teacher. And he refused to go on. When a metaphysician heard about, he was talking about Egypt, he came down because he wanted to hear him. He wanted answers to his questions about Egypt. And Edgar Casey heard what the, the voice said and refused to go on. He was a Sunday school teacher. Mm-hmm. This was not in line with, I assumed he was a Southern Baptist. In Bible Sunday Belt. School, Bible Belt. Yeah. And he refused to go on. This was that stuff. And the voice said, you can refuse, you'll lose your voice again. <laughs> All right, spiritual compliance. Yeah. So I'm reading Edgar Casey, and because that's part of the Gestalt in the Hay Ashbury. I remember those days. Okay. I mean, people. I knew of people back in the 1960s who invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in survival equipment because they believed the earth the were imminent. That California was going to fall into the ocean. I myself believed at one point I lost my wallet with thousands of dollars in it because I was trying to get all my... That's what fear does. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not going to, 
But once you have a thought that is going to <laughs> it sort of yeah, yeah. captivate you, yeah. it could happen tomorrow. Yes. That's the way I've been with the stock market. Once I realized that this was all smoke and mirrors and we're on water, I thought it could happen at any time. And I believe that since the 1990s. Well, and if you study the history of Christianity, you'll see that for well over a thousand years. People have been expected. P- the, the end of the world. What's coming. Yeah. Okay. And including in Jesus' own time, there's good reason to think Jesus believed the end of the world was imminent. Well, that makes me feel much better. Why? Because when I read this stuff in the 1960s, and I'm reading Edgar Cayce, and I really loved Edgar Cayce's heart. In fact, you know, when we were talking about um, Don Juan and the way of the heart, I realized I've always had a predilection of the heart, even when I was into existentialism. When I was in existentialism in my early college years, which is disease of the mind, of the Western mind, the existentialist philosophers I liked were two of them. Martin Buber, the Jewish existentialist, and Miguel de Unamuno, the Spanish Catholic existentialist, because mm-hmm. both of them had heart. Mm-hmm. The French existentialists were too cut and dry for me. Yeah. But these Martin Buber and Miguel de Unamuno... I didn't know why I liked it, but in retrospect, they resonated mm-hmm. at a certain level. They were still existentialists, but they, they both had heart. Mm-hmm. Or at least they felt it. Okay? So there I am, reading Edgar Casey, and I loved him. He never charged for readings. He could take donations, but it wasn't about the money. In fact, he died at an early death because he was told he should limit himself to three readings a day. But this was in the early 40s, and World War II was going on, and people were frantic to know about their kids. Frantic. And Edgar Casey didn't take the advice, did more, and he died probably what was an early death mm. than he than he usually was. But anyway, I loved his heart. I loved what he wrote. He was told that he should not eat um uh, red meat, that chicken and fish were wrong, and he said he could never stop eating bacon. Mm. I like that, but not that he ate bacon. <laughs> he was honest enough yeah. to know. Okay. He was a human being mm-hmm. who was gifted with this gift that he didn't expect. He didn't even, he was like Helen Schuckman. They were gift and Helen Schuckman, the lady who channeled the Course in Miracles. And igno- an atheist. Yeah. A behavioral scientist yeah. of the nth degree. Mm-hmm. If you couldn't count it, it didn't exist. And all of a sudden, this voice is talking through her in the iambic pentameter <laughs> that claims to be, or says in a, in a roundabout, he's, it's the voice of Jesus. And she's Jewish yeah. and a feminist. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming out of her. She can stop at any time, but it's coming out of Helen. Mm-hmm. So the people who are vehicles for these aren't necessarily the vehicles because they agree with it. All right. In fact, I love the one. There's a, a, a sort of a, an aside. In, in England, in the early 1900s, there was a magazine called Psychic, I think Psychic Magazine. It was a big one. And it was, it was published by Morris, some, I forget his last name. What people didn't know is he was the channel for Silver Birch. Hmm. Incredible. It was like White Eagle, White Lily. Silver Birch was a phenomenal font of knowledge and wisdom that was coming through England at that time. Okay. And he never told anybody he was a channel. He was just the editor of the magazine. You know, he, he wouldn't have a life. Be like, you know, and how he got into it, he didn't believe this stuff. All right. He was young, Jewish kid. That's, that's what my first key was because I read about the circle that he was in, you know, that, that transcribed his stuff. <laughs> Three of the five were Jewish. You go, well, that's a high percentage in a psychic circle. Mm-hmm. It's because Morris was Jewish, okay? I think. That's why there were so many in there. But he had gone to this psychic seance, disbelieving totally that this stuff existed. And, and he fell, fell asleep. He passed, he went out. And when he woke up, everyone was going, oh man, the stuff you said. <laughs> he goes, what? <laughs> oh, you said these things. They were shocked. Well, if they were shocked, so was he. Yeah. And then they recorded it. All right? And then what they had, it was really great because they had somebody uh, record the sessions. Stenographer? Who, had, who, was, who was blind. Oh. So he did Braille, and they did it in the dark. Mm. So that was genius. Yeah. So for decades... Morris, whatever, did this. And they said later, his channel, Silver Birch, said they picked him 
because of his background, because of his ability. And they knew he had no idea he was going to do it. Mm. They knew that Morris didn't believe in it. They knew it. And yet he was the one who was chosen to be the vehicle for this knowledge, like mm. Helen Shuckman was, mm. right? like Edgar Casey. Mm. So there I am, a hippie in my early 20s, taking acid, smoking dope, like all the other hippies, are, and we're reading Edgar Casey. Five years later, we're reading Carlos Castaneda. We're experimenting with sex, drugs, vegetarianism. Everything this is on in the 60s, okay? And the music is wonderful, all right? Much to the chagrin of our parents yep. and the culture at large. Mm -hmm. But there we were. And I run at Edgar Casey, and I liked his heart. He didn't charge. He had questions about what he was doing, just like I did. And then what really impacted me was he talked about the earth changes. Mm -hmm. Like you said, people were they thought it was imminent. Yeah. We all knew. East Coast was falling. West Coast was falling. The Great Lakes were empty into the Mississippi River Valley. Japan was going to the ocean. I mean, those of us who were there, we could recite it. And I, like I told you last night, he said, this would be a prelude to the Golden Age. Now, I heard those words, and I heard the words Earth Changes. And last night I told you, Jeffrey, when I heard that stuff, I, by I bypassed the Golden Age the purpose of, and focused in on the Earth Changes. Why? Because the mind attaches the fear. Mm -hmm. My mind did. The mind attaches to fear. All right? It can, and so, as a culture, a lot of us got sucked into, it's going to happen. Yep. Well, it didn't. <laughs> At least while we were in the Hate Ashbury. Okay? So, the next time I run into the earth changes is in the idea in a significant way is um, 20 years later. Okay? And I'm reading a series of books called Sienda Rohan, Right Use of Will. The Right Use of Will. The right use of will is is in my l library of fun of foundation books, mm -hmm. along with the Course in Miracles, along with the Impersonal Life, all right, and a few others that are there. The right use of will gave a balance to what I had absorbed from the Course in Miracles. I went through the Course in Miracles three times. I did it myself. Three years, so it took it four years. I'm reading this book. I'm really into it, and I had a certain point of view, and then. Then a few years later, within 10 years later, um, Right Use of Will and seven of, six of the books come in. They're channeled by Sienda Rohan. Stunning books. And like, if, if the Course in Miracles is, came from Jesus as its source, yeah. the Right Use of Will came from Jesus' dad. <laughs> All right? And he, it, God, what we call God, mm -hmm. talks about how it came into being, how this came into being, and all the problems we're having, and why they're here, and what's going to happen. You could say, when you use the term God, something like the force of goodness that is the ground of all being and the source of creation. Absolutely. Or the I am that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, one of my playing on words was, you know, uh, who was it? So, I am, I, I, I think, therefore I am. Yes. One of the things Descartes. I... Yeah, Descartes. Yeah, okay. I think, therefore I am. If you look at my book, uh, Light in the Dark Place, my own play on it is, I think, therefore I forget that I am that I am. <laughs> huh? yeah. I think, therefore I forget that I am that I am. <laughs> okay? That's my retort. Yeah, it's pretty profound. I thought it was, yeah. but then again, it came out of my head, so I don't like to toot it too much. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't like to say, you know, I heard something really profound. In fact, it came from me. <laughs> <laughs> forget Descartes. Yeah, forget it. This is better. Listen to this. <laughs> this is a 21st century iteration. But anyway, so I'm into this stuff. And I'm now I'm reading a book that I consider profound. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it introduced me to the importance of my emotions. Like I said before, I'm polarized to my intellect. I'm Chinese. I'm male. I'm an Aquarian. You don't get more polarized than that. All right. Emotions were like, you know, you know, wow. All right. And so, what I learned from these books was they were half of creating that. The, it says it's all spirit of will, like the yin and the yang. It says spirit is what you perceive as the male force, awareness, consciousness. The feminine force is feeling. All right? And it manifests to you, it's the will. So you have spirit and will, the two polarities of creation. The oneness polarizing the two, the interaction between the two created what we know as the universe mm -hmm. or the manifest creation. Mm -hmm. Right, and he said he and the mother were having a fight <laughs> from the very beginning. All right, and this is how he explained it. Makes sense to me. 
that before they went into manifestation, they're moving towards this. It was all the void, the void, yeah. moving very close to manifestation. Okay. The feminine part goes, we're not ready yet. You know, it's like, let's slow it up. And as they move closer, the male part goes, oh, we're almost there. Let's go. Let's go. And it's like, they're like this. And the male part pushed it. And all hell broke loose because they weren't ready. We weren't ready. And they split, they split off into polarized polarities that were distinct for the first time in creation because physical creation never happened. So you had the separate will, the separate oh, spirit having separate experiences. I mean, they botched the whole creation. Well, it didn't go as planned. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right? Because there are no botching. Yeah. All right? uh -huh. and, and that's what he said. It didn't go as planned. At least not according to their plan. Their plan. Yes. It didn't go according to their plan. And he said, a lot of the misunderstandings happen in that first split between the two polarities. Yeah. He said, misunderstandings that you are carrying in yourself as males or as females mm -hmm. this time. Because, you know, we switch and forth at, from this way between we're not our bodies, we're not mm -hmm. our genders, we're pure spirit, yeah. and we're polarized spirit. So to learn and to manifest ourselves, we will alternate between different projections mm -hmm. in different genders and different variations of the two. But the truth is there are endemic there are problems endemic to the relationship between the two that are only now being healed. Okay? So that's why these books got my attention. Because yes. I was so polarized to thinking and all of a sudden this area that's the feeling comes up goes, you know, Daryl, if you want your life to be working, you better pay attention to this. Because you ain't going to make it only this way. Mm -hmm. You got to make room for your feet. One of the sayings is, prison was a cage I learned to share with my feelings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Because that's where, I, that's where these books came and taught me. Mm -hmm. When I'm reading these books, profound, Jeffrey. At the highest level. At the deepest level. And I've already been through the Course of Miracles. So these books are... Even more profound. Okay, so I'm in a profundity in certain things. And then it says about the earth changes. He says, I am going to bring down the earth changes, God. Because the problem with evolution or creation is that the, the polarities have been, are, are, have been holding the, the, the feminine energy back in abeyance. He said the spirit energy, the will, is much more evolved. Doesn't mean better, but it's run, it's had its run of the place. All right. And it's faster. He said this, the, the will creation, the feminine part is magnetic. So you have spirit, which is electrical. You have the will, which is feminine, is magnetic, and it holds the emotions. And he said, the emotions that are not expressed cannot move. And he said, creation has caused tremendous problems. Feeling, abandonment, loss, terror, rage, blame. He said, if you had allowed these feelings to move when they first manifested, you would have learned from them. Because all they were were reactions to phenomena. Natural reactions to what is. But you held them, and you've kept them locked in, and you've justified not feeling them or feeling them. And when he says you, he's meaning human Us, beings. Spirits in manifestation. Yeah. Us. Uh-huh. As a part of him yeah. and her. Mm-hmm. Because he says, you guys are us. Down there. You're, yeah. We're all one. Yeah. You're us. Yeah. And your whole, he said, so us to, for us to move, he and the mother, you guys got to move. Because mm -hmm. you're holding your pieces too, but you're not hold, you're not allowing. You won't feel them because you're so scared of the feelings. In other words, you're you're getting at what we might call the co-evolution of humans with God. Ah, you got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. We share the upside and the downside. The problems of the promise. Mm -hmm. Creation. The problems of the promise. No creation. The promise. And the problems. <laughs> <laughs> Sell the upside first. Yeah. Sell the upside. Get yeah. them in the audience. Then tell them the truth. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So that's what it is. So I'm stunned with these books. Stunned. Mm -hmm. All right. In fact, this is how they nailed me to the wall. He goes, you think 
you explain things with karma. That good things happen because of good karma, bad things happen because of bad karma. He says, the universe is not judgmental. Let me tell you. You're judgmental. The universe isn't. I'm not. N neither is a mother. We're love. The reason, what karma is to them, he said, let me explain karma in what it, to our terms what it means. Karma is the result of withheld patterns, unexpressed emotions that are going to bring back time and time again the trigger event attempting to trigger those emotions. So if you have bad relationships, okay, they keep going a certain way, it's because you are, you have an issue with either the mother or the father, mother polarity, father polarity, in you that needs to move. It could be abandonment, it could be loss, it could be rage, it could be any of these things that you went through in a previous lifetime or you're holding for the Gestalt and it's got to move. It's in there. It's a result of a previous experience that you have not allowed to move. And until you allow it to move, it's, it's going to get you. And the more you try and suppress it, the, the bigger it's going to try and get. So it said, if you are in a place not to your liking, ask yourself why. So hey, first you're in prison. Mm. I'm reading this book, fascinated with metaphysics. Mm -hmm. I'm really reading it. And my big problem was, you know, I hate my boss. You know? <laughs> or the food in this place is terrible. How do you get it? No. My ten why am I in prison? Yeah. So I close my eyes. This is what it said. Ask yourself why you're in a place not your liking. Mm -hmm. So I go, why am I here? Boom! The answer comes back. You have feelings of powerlessness. Well, I could justify this to the day in and day out because my father ran us like a boot camp for our own good. He's a Capricorn. He thought discipline was good, that we should study all the time, that we should do all these good things and not waste any time. You know, like a good... A, a strict... A strict, good, well-meaning parent would think. Yeah. To an Aquarian, this was pretty close to hell. Mm -hmm. All right? Don't like rules. Don't like people. I'll tell you what. You know... What the hell is he doing? What you know? I mean, when the hell are we going through this shit? You know, house was clean enough to me. You know, so it was like it was war. Yeah, I mean, it was war. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I mean war. Mm -hmm. So I had no power in that relationship. So when I finally got away from, I want to do everything I want, and then I'm up against it, the deep state. <laughs> they want us to go to war. I knew why they, I read books, but I read, knew who Dulles was and his brothers and, you know, the mm -hmm. reason why they, the, the imperialism in, in China. I knew why we were there. You know, and I had no power. They wanted to pick our asses up, draft us, and go get killed or be killed. Yep. Another, no powerless. Mm -hmm. So, and then we were hippies. Illegal smoking pot, taking ass, everything we did was All illegal. of that All during that. the Vietnam War well, era. Pile, they piled it on. Yeah. So, I had feelings of helplessness. Uh-huh. I didn't know that not expressing these feelings, not feeling them, was going to evoke a situation so intense that I was helpless, that I was actually helpless. I didn't know that was the consequence of not feeling my feelings. I, because this is what the right use of will said. What you call karma, which is consequence of previous actions, mm -hmm. is karmic in the sense that you are withholding feelings that you are refusing to feel, and you're going to draw to yourself a situation that's going to trigger those feelings against your will. So I was holding, I was trying to hold feelings of helplessness away from me. No one wants to feel helpless. No one. Certainly I, an Aquarian. You know, a guy who wants to feel help. So I could justify not feeling helpless till the day, till the day ended, yeah. till week, till, till eternity. I had never considered the possibility that my refusing to feel certain feelings was going to evoke a situation bigger than I can control to release, the, make me feel those feelings. Wow. Took you by surprise. Holy smokes. Made a believer out of me. Mm hmm so I started decided I better start feeling my feelings. Yeah. And along with that came the the earth changes. Mm -hmm. Where God said, I am going to bring down the earth changes to help humanity feel these feelings it's been holding back. And in other words, the very same situation that uh, resulted in you being in prison is going according to, to this viewpoint, going to force a collective force. To, for all of humanity, humanity on this planet because they're refusing to feel what they're not letting move in their emotional body uh -huh. in their magnetic emotional body we're so like this yeah. and it's holding creation up 
It's holding the father and mother up. Mm -hmm. It's holding us up. It's holding the planetary ascension up. Mm -hmm. We are holding it up. And it ain't going to wait anymore. So, we're going to get a little nudge. And he said this. You have a choice. You have a choice to go inside and allow yourself to feel these feelings on your own. So, you don't have to meet them in an outer yeah. mirror. Mm -hmm. Or cause it. Yeah. And that's when I told you just earlier that I went to a healer, extraordinary healer named Katie K. Lane. Extraordinary. And I, I went to her with Martha and Yazio here with me now, you know, here in Albuquerque. And they just, when they got on the table with her, Martha went so high, Yazi came back, he couldn't talk. Me, I passed out. Oh, yes. Because I couldn't stay present. Yeah. Because I was a control freak. Still. I couldn't stay. I, 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 this I, is recently. Yeah, last year. I was afraid to go into my emotions. That's what I knew. My, Even after all you've all been through. Stuff, all that stuff. That's how resistant I am. I know myself. But you have to say this with regard to the planetary changes. People on this planet are largely responsible for what's happening totally. in, in, in terms of uh, the global warming oh. that could melt and the no, polar okay. ice caps. And they're still denying it. Yeah. This, their, their, their reaction to the crisis that faces are like their reaction to the emotions. Denial and suppression. Yeah. And so when I told Katie, I met her, she thought I was just making stuff up. Yeah. I said, Katie, I'm really... I got I got this stuff that doesn't tend to move, all right? And I'm afraid unless this you because I had heard what you can do. Mm -hmm. Unless it's called gateway healing. Mm -hmm. It's psych it's really high. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said, unless this works, Katie, I may find myself in the middle of an earthquake. And, and this you is meant I, meant. To. I told her. I said, unless this seminar helps me, yeah. I may find myself in the middle of an earthquake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and you know just to release it, mm -hmm. and she didn't believe. I kept going out. I kept going out, yeah. and then finally the next day she helped other people, out and I got through it. Mm -hmm. right. but, but that's how much I believe why it happens and what it does. So that was the 1980s. Mm -hmm. All right, I, whew, there were changes. So then I come to Tucson, and I come to Tucson, which is a hotbed of spiritual thought. Yeah. I mean, there's so much metaphysical stuff going on in Tucson. It's like the hippie days in San Francisco. I tell people, Tucson changed me just like the San Francisco changed me in the 60s. And they don't understand because what happened in San Francisco is real infamous. You know, the Grateful Dead, the oh, rock yeah. and roll, drugs, hippies, sex, drugs, and rock yeah, and roll. Yeah. What's happening in Tucson is not infamous. Spirit of love. Spirit of, spirit of love. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And what's no, Tucson is much more low key. Mm -hmm. it's, it's below, right now it's below the radar. Yeah. Okay. But it changed me because I was open to all this stuff. But the thing, the, the, the thing was this. So I come to Tucson and I go to the spiritualist church, Temple of Universality. And Monica Rankin, who's been involved in spiritual, she just passed this year. I mean, she's like a saint in this thing. She's basically supported spiritual. She hands me two channelings on nerve changes. As soon as you walk in. As soon as in. I walk in, basically. Within yeah. the first year. Uh huh. She doesn't know me from Adam. She gives me two channelings mm -hmm. on the earth changes that came through Dr. Robert Ireland while he's in a trance state and the entity Dr. Carlos Blair would lecture once a week in Tucson. Since the mid-1980s, for around 15 years, Dr. Robert Ireland, a psychic medium, yes. would go into trance, go out for 30 minutes. The entity, the conscious entity known as Dr. Carlos Blair would come in and speak with a Scottish accent on all these metaphysical subjects and take questions from the audience. Now, just for historical background, Dr. Robert Ireland, uh, was he one of the founders of the church? No. Robert, Robert yeah. Ireland was, is, is sort of famous in our world. I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, he died. The uh, brother of Richard Ireland. Richard Ireland, who was really famous. Oh, yes, I met Richard Ireland. Oh, you did? Yes. When? was back in the um, 1980s. Wow. Yeah. No, I, it was unimpressive. Okay. But <laughs> okay. In, in fact, if anything, <laughs> it's connected to something of a, di a disaster. minor disaster. disaster. Okay. But, we know them because we have, yeah. but Richard, now Richard Ireland, they're both the children of Margaret Fling. 
who channeled White Lily. Yeah, I, I should say to, to to compliment him, Richard Ireland is the one who trained my good friend, who who I've interviewed years ago. I haven't interviewed him for a long time. Hope to bring him back. A magnificent trans channeler, Kevin Ryerson. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I mean, so. And in fact, of all the people who are into spiritualism or mediumship, yeah. Richard had the deepest connection to esoteric thought. He understood the connection of spiritual phenomena to... He was like a Las Vegas performer. Oh, he did. No, he used to put on shows. He, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of people didn't like him. Yeah. Because they, they thought, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. He, he just wanted to spread the word. Yeah. In fact, if you Google Richard Ireland and Steve Allen, you'll see about Steve Allen. Sure. And this is the stuff that Hoyt did. Yeah. Blindfold billets. Yeah. Which we've seen a lot of. Yeah. All yeah. right? Yeah. This is the phenomenon. Yeah. So anyway, his brother... Bob Ireland goes into trance every week in Tucson. Around 40 people show up. I'm not there. They're all taped. Mm -hmm. You go to the Temple of Universality website, and they're, they're taped by Fred Smith. He's uh -huh. got all the tapes. And anyhow, so you have now the transcripts. Transcripts. From Bob Ireland. No, really Carlos Blair through Bob Ireland uh -huh. on the Earth Changes. Okay. So I'm reading them. Wow. He gave two talks on the Earth Changes. In his second talk, one in 1980, one in 1992, he refers back to the 1980 talk. Mm. Twelve years later, mm -hmm. refers back to the 1982 talk in church. Now, of course, people were asking questions, saying, when's this going to happen? No. His answer was, before the year 2000. Now, I'm reading this in 2007, 2008. Yeah. If it happened... I'm in a parallel universe that Hugh Everett postulated called the Princeton School of, 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 of Physics. Right. And I'm in, in my universe, it didn't happen. It is a dead. Yeah. So. It's one way to look at one it. One way to look at it. One way to explain it. <laughs> yeah. All right. And I. Without having to say he was wrong. wrong. <laughs> or I was wrong. Yeah. Okay. Well, he was wrong because he had made the statement. Right. <laughs> and, and the other thing was, was that. I had read other metaphysical things that also said the golden age was going to come by the year 2000. Mm -hmm. The Mark Age books were adamant about the date. Yeah. All right? And I read that too. All right? Now, I got to say that I was so busy with going to prison and <laughs> keeping my own life together and trying to make me, that it was either going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. But I kept track of this stuff in yeah. my brain. Well, what we're getting at here, uh, maybe just to give a little context, there's a wonderful book. I wouldn't take it 100% at face value, but I still think it's a wonderful book. It's a sociology classic by Leon Festinger. It's called When Prophecy Fails. Oh, really? Yes. Yes, and it's a study of, of a spiritualist group uh, who had prophecies of the world was going to end on a particular date. Days, and, yeah. and what happened to the group when that didn't happen? And half the people left and the other half made up reasons why, well, the prophecy really was true. You know, I, I would, I, I think, I know it would be an interesting book, but I think it would be flawed from my point of view mm -hmm. because I told you earlier today about another study yeah. of prophecy yeah. by Gr Gregory Lazanoff, Dr. Gregory Gregory Lazanoff, mm -hmm. who who studied all the predictions of Baba Vanga. Yes, that very from famous Bulgaria. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I know about that yes. is I believe she was the true. I don't know about this group of because everybody's making prophecies. Right. Okay. I know in my heart of hearts, Baba Vanga was the real deal. Yeah. And I sent you a a a, 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 a article about her from Joshua Kessler. Yeah. Remember the UCLA professor? Who yeah, uh -huh. and I sent you he'd gone to he was in yeah. Bulgaria. Yeah. He runs into he's not intending mm -hmm. to go see a psychic at all. Yeah. Nineteen early nineteen seventies. He's over there for a poetry conference. And because the head of the Bulgarian poetry thing is called to Russia. And he's stuck there. Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to take you to see Baba Vanga. Now, he's not particularly into psychics, but this is, you know, he's, he's their guest. Right. So they arranged him to go to see this person he's never met, Baba Vanga, who's a blind psychic, the blind prophet. Okay. So, Regarded as sort of a witch. Well, they call her that, but yeah. not in Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. They have a tradition of psychics and mediums. Yeah. We call him a witch, uh -huh. not the Bulgarians. Okay. She was on the state dole. Mm. 
the state of Bulgaria supported her because of her ability to call things as okay. they are, which is a Marxist state. Yeah. So they take Dr. Kessler, Dr. Kessler, UCLA professor, soon to be Professor Emeritus, whose brother is a very highly respected political scientist in the United States. So to kill time, he's taken out to see this blind, the blind prophet. He doesn't know who she is at all. Okay. They take him out to see her. He goes in, and the girl goes, Oh, I forgot. What? I was supposed to, we were supposed to sleep with sugar underneath our pillows to give them to her. It's like psychometry. She mm -hmm. can pick up stuff. She forgot too bad. So they go in there. There's her back to him. She can't see him anyway. And she goes, hey, Where's the sugar? And she, oh, she says, Oh, yeah, this is all right. She says, oh, Does he have a watch? Yeah, take it. That'll work. She holds the watch. Oh, you're Jewish. Yes. Now, everybody gets, because Europe's very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. All she said is, you're Jewish. She didn't say, oh, you're a fucking Jew. She didn't say, <laughs> she says, yes, I am. And they go, oh, no. She said, I'm Jewish. That's all right. She says, She's Jewish. Then she says, hmm. She says, um, you live, you eat old bread. Kessler said, yeah, they used to go to Orohui and buy day old and freeze it. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, okay, you know, that's true. Okay. You live near the ocean. He lived two blocks from Santa Monica Beach. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you're not going to get rich. <laughs> well, Kessler never, he's a professor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big deal with him, but he, he had pretty much assumed that. But she's just cut, rolling off that st mm -hmm. stuff to come to her mind. And then she says something about his brother mm -hmm. and his shocks Kessler. Like, holy shit, she hit him. And then she talked, his mother, she said something, somebody's very worried. It was his mother-in-law. She was very worried about the health of her daughter, who was very ill. Mm -hmm. And she called that. Okay, so Kessler's in there sort of shocked. And then she says this. You know anything about the brotherhood? And he goes, no. He says, you will. They will meet you soon. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know? And, and, and so, and one of the things that Baba Vanga said, that the new religion that's going to come over this is going to come from the brotherhood, mm -hmm. the great white brotherhood. Okay. Kessler wasn't into this, okay? He, as an addendum to his article, you can Google Kessler, Baba Vanga, and hopefully find this piece, okay? Mm -hmm. But th that's how I had to run it down again before I bookmarked it, because it keeps getting away from me. Kessler said, a couple years later, he's in, uh, he'd come from a conference, and he's in Paris. And they're checking in the hotel, and this guy said, uh, he didn't have any money. You know, he, he didn't have his wallet. So he, and he looks at Kessler and said, can you give me the money? Kessler said, he just gave him 50 bucks. And Kessler said he was sort of shocked that he had done it without, mm -hmm. without even being paranoid. Just yeah. handed it to the guy. So they became, they, they got close to the conference, and Kessler, and they shook hands, and he said the guy shook his hand, and he kept one finger Folded in, uh -huh. which is the password of the Masonic organization. Yeah, he didn't know this, right? So Kessler just noted that they became close, and they were talking about. It. He said, "Are you aware of the White Brotherhood?" Because he remembered what Bob Vanga he said. That's one of the teachings, of, inner teachings of the Masonic Order. Mm -hmm. We don't tell that to other people. And he said the American Lodge. He didn't consider the American Lodge authentic. Mm -hmm. He was an old-time British Lodge Freemason. Mm -hmm. All right? And so th there was another thing with, with her. So that's what I would say about when, when um, because Gregory Lazanoff, who Marshall brought over to study his super learning Your techniques. Friend Marshall My Thurber. friend Marshall brought Baba right. Lazanoff over. Yes. Lazanoff, because of his he super He also uh, endorsed Baba Vanga. Baba Vanga. And he said... 15% of her predictions turned out not to be true. Mm -hmm. So he had done a scientific study of a known psyche, which I would say is far to me, because I believe because I believe this other guy is going to do a crazy group and yeah. they're all over the place. Yeah. But I know Bob, I believe Bob Vaughn is the real deal. Well, let me just ask <laughs> yeah. you this. Now, you're an expert in financial forecasting. Yeah. And pretty much as a trader, I know that any trading system always comes with this caveat, which is that past results are no Do not guarantee, guarantee of future results. Yes. Absolutely. 
Well, that's good. Okay, now, <laughs> that's great. They're bringing a financial caveat to our listening audience. Whatever we're saying here, if you go long on gold, it's the fact that it worked in the past or long on stocks is not a particular future. It's the same thing. Yeah. Except I believe th in this. I believe that the authentic communicators, that the authentic ones who touch the other side, like... They're they're around us now. Are, are you know? And I, not everything they say is true. Is going to come true. In fact, this is what happened with the Earth changes. This is what happened with the Earth changes. So I read these channelings of Carlos Blair. Yes. In two thousand seven, they haven't happened. Right. All right. And because I'm really glued to there. Well, the second question I asked Hoyt was the Earth changes mm -hmm. in two thousand five, and his answer was day by day. That's what he said, day by day. Okay. Wow. And that's true. If you look around, there's slowly things happening a little bit here, if, a little if, bit if there. If the viewers want to go to my website, www.drc, which is one of my websites, I post articles twice a week, and the earth changes are part of the deal. Yeah. We're like the frog in the uh, pot of pot. water that's slowly Bifurcated. getting hotter. It's slowly getting hotter, and because it's not hot at once, he doesn't jump out. Yeah. He just goes, this is the way it is, and drowns. Yeah. Okay? This is what we're doing. We're getting used to crises. We're getting inured to radical change. Mm -hmm. We're getting dissociated from what's going on around us. And to political dysfunction. And to political dysfunction. We're just accepting it as part of what's going on. Yeah. We are disconnected from the failure of institutional reform and the need for reform that's going on. The old order is passing. And our reaction to it is not real good for, for a consciousness that wants to evolve and learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be forced and have our faces rubbed in it. It's going to take us over. That's my belief. So anyway, I'm reading this stuff. It's supposed to happen by 2000. It hasn't happened. And so in 2009, I'm in a, in, a, in a direct voice with Hoyt Robinette. And a direct voice, the way I describe it is, you're talking to the burning bush. Mm -hmm. All right? You're not talking to an intermediary. Mm -hmm. If you're in a direct voice with a bona fide psychic media, you're talking to it. Mm -hmm. All right? And it's coming through. So I'm with Hoyt. And they asked me, Dr. Kenner, because I know his gatekeeper, uh, do you have any questions? And I go, no. I said, yes, because I really have questions. He said, what is it? He said, well, I said, you know, Dr. Kenner, I'm into the earth changes. Okay, and I've been following him. And I just run across some channelings from Dr. Carlos Blair, where he made some predictions about the earth changes. And he said they were going to happen by the year 2000. And I said, now, it's 2009, and they haven't happened. And I know on the other side, there's no time and space, so it's hard to predict. And all of a sudden, we're interrupted. Boom. Hello. This is Dr. Carlos Blair. Thank you for the wiggle room, but I don't need it. Certainly, they didn't happen by the year 2000, as, as he predicted. They are going to happen nonetheless. I go, really? He said, yes. And I said, in the degree of severity that you predicted? And he said, yes. That was good enough for me. <laughs> now, given the fact that I believe there's a metaphysical reason for the earth changes to cause us to let loose those emotional things that we're holding on to, that is, is even more important now because we haven't certainly let them go. Yeah. We're just still holding them on. And I know my resistance is a human being. And if I'm going to think I'm that resistant and I want to evolve and I want to open up, but there are parts of me that are holding on so tight that I have to go to Katie Kayleen and <laughs> get an extra boost. <laughs> if I'm that resistant and I want to evolve, I want to have these things happen, that humanity being another piece of us may be just the, as resistant as I am and need, and well, not need. That's what God it said. It was inevitable, one might say, you were going to get uh, end up in prison. You benefited from it enormously at the end of the day, and you're suggesting that... The earth changes are the same thing. There you have it. One of the things God said was this. You may know, you, he said, you have no idea how much better some of you are going to feel once it's over. <sighs> because the burden that you've been carrying, the emotional blockage that you've had is going to be cleared up. It's like a cosmic cleanse. All right. We're really impacted. All right. And the only thing it's going to take is a cosmic cleanse of an order that we're not in charge of. I believe it's going to happen. I believe in order in the universe. I, I may be wrong. I don't care. You know, these are the thoughts that I have. 
And like I said, Jeffrey, I don't talk about this to a lot of people. This realities that are not given acceptance in the cultural zeitgeist. But well, I accept uh, that you're coming from your heart. You're coming from your deepest insights. Uh, they are. And, and you're coming from what I think William James would call radical empiricism, direct experiences that you have had at an inner level, looking inside of yourself. Jeffrey, I wish I could have recorded that and told my father when he was still alive. Dad, I am coming from what William James called radical empir empiricism. Yeah. I am coming. <laughs> My father's a civil engineer. He just doesn't want me to go to prison. He wants me to be successful, raise these kids. And I'm, I'm off the reservation. Yeah. But he wasn't. I wasn't meant to tell him that. <laughs> it wouldn't have served any good. He just had to deal with me as he was. I had to accept him as he was. And we made peace. Mm -hmm. My mother died in 92, and it brought my father and I together. Well, I think what you're saying is that, number one, we're going to go through some horrible situations, and number two, we are in a loving universe. I love that way to hold it, Jeffrey. I absolutely do. You, in two sentences, summed up what I would like people to know. You have gotten an extraordinary, and I, and I like the fact that you just put out the call for, listen, can you help this? I think it's important. I think your channel is important. I've never seen anybody like it. I haven't seen anything like it. It's not left. It's not ideological. It's like, what's new? And the fact that you could see the earth changes in that thing, Jeffrey, is that you deserve every bit of support in these changes that, that the universe can muster. Because you're not blind to what's going on. You haven't turned away from what's going on. You've been unflinching in what you're looking at what may be going on, and you've also seen the love that it seems to be repelling this reality. And that takes a lot to see the love that's happening. That's... Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. Well, what a pleasure to be with you. And I know uh, we've just completed our third interview today, but you're going to be with me tomorrow. No, we've got, got some more to say. We've got some more to say. I, and I'm just delighted that you're here. I am honored that we're talking. Yeah. So, That's from the hippie and, part. And thank you. Thank you for being with us as yeah. well. 